You're welcome. Thanks, Freya. Um, to, to facilitate this session, I'm really excited about this session. We've got some amazing speakers. Uh, and I'll be back shortly um, with Rob to, to talk through um, Junga's club um, role in this project. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, yeah, Hugh Forehead, I've uh, lead uh, the, yeah, the joy of leading the developing and enabling stream in both futures. Um, got a great seminar uh, today. Um, and, and again, yeah, I'd like to thank um, Global Challenges for, yeah, for this opportunity. We've, uh, it's, it's been a great privilege and um, yeah, I feel like we've achieved a lot um, and, and I set up really well to do some exciting work in the next few years too. So thank you, Global Challenges. Uh, and thank you everyone for, um, for coming along. Uh, we've got a, I said, an exciting uh, session today. We've got three um, great speakers, uh, starting off with uh, Rob Chu Ying, a UN man, an Aboriginal activist, and a very successful businessman on the South Coast with a strong social conscience. Uh, Ewan Bash, uh, an oyster farmer, an innovator, and an entrepreneur uh, with some great tech, uh, which, which I've been um, lucky to be a part of. And uh, finally, but certainly not least, uh, Pierre Winberg, scientist, a groundbreaking entrepreneur, seaweed researcher and grower. So all very exciting. And um, since I'm not uh, the business person of this team, uh, Tillman Bohm will be uh, coordinating the, um, the interactions uh, with the speakers. Uh, Tillman's a creative, collaborative, innovative minded person, startup entrepreneur, senior lecturer, uh, his order, not mine. Uh, and the next person is supply chain analysis. He's an experienced applied field researcher working alongside practice. Uh, his practice is in, sorry, his passion is in bridging the relevancy gap between academia practitioners, uh, putting relevant academic theory into practice and sharing his insights with academia through publications. This approach allows for research impact beyond just journal publications. And Tillman's conducted research in many industries in Australia, New Zealand, Austria, Netherlands, and Germany. So. Uh, Without further ado, over to you, Tillman. I think I need to work on a one-line introduction. Right? This is like, anyway, that's, uh, that's for now. I, I actually came to this project and I remember going to Michelle and says, well, you know, Michelle, I got so much on, I'm happy to not be included. And uh, she insisted. So thank you, Michelle, for your, that you insisted, you know, I was like, this is, this has been awesome. I really enjoyed it. And uh, there was a meeting with, with Hugh. And so Hugh and I, we've been collaborating on this. And we met Michelle. And then I was like, what are we doing here? I was like, I don't know. It's, uh... But I was already working in Tricep. So Tricep is a translational research initiative. And they are doing some really interesting stuff around bioprinting. And they were actually using Pia's uh, seaweed already for bio inks for wound healing purposes. And so you kind of 3D print a bio scaffold and then kind of your own stem cells can grow and replace or the, uh, is the idea that, you know, you actually replace your own skin. Um, and so I was running a workshop with uh, the entrepreneurs program uh, of the Australian government. And we, um, I was doing a 3D printing workshop, trying to translate 3D printing knowledge into uh, manufacturing businesses. And it was really, really successful. You know, like with people then adopting the technology, playing with it. And so I, I went to, to Hugh and I says, why don't we take some of these IoT sensors that Smart is working on, why don't we take some of these sensors and we just go and visit the South Coast, visit some companies, we drop the sensors in, and then we have a workshop and find out how this would uh, impact on uh, on their value streams you know how would they adopt it and um it was it was yeah you, you can't make it up but you get paid for this right so we went out uh, with, with you uh, you and megash we, we went out on the on the oyster farm on his boat uh, we went and ate mussels straight off the the, the lines in jervis bay we watched pierre's lab uh, in in what they call Huskinson. So it was was super interesting. Like, you know, you get paid for it, as I said. So really blessed in that. And now I don't even have to hold the whole seminar. I'm just gonna uh, pass over to to Rob uh, to talk all things Jungla. But the I think the last con I was wanting to make is um, is really the 
the connections we made by traveling down the coast and the opportunities we all identified to actually strengthen the collaboration between industry and university. And I know uh, Pia has been doing this for a long, long time now. Uh, and I'm glad she's going to also present her collaborative um, movements that she's doing with, with the university. But it's, I'm really looking forward for, the, for phase two. And uh, Junga is going to play a big part in that. And I happily pass over to Rob because we're here to hear from businesses, not from academics, right? So, good day, everyone. Um, Robert Turing, traditional owner. Um, my area is uh, down the south coast in Bateman's Bay, so it extends from Bateman's Bay probably down to around about uh, just Eden area, which is the Wabunja area. I'd just like to pay my respects to uh, the traditional owners of um, this country. And um, I'd also like to say that um, it's really nice to be, I suppose, in this meeting. And it's a very casual meeting. Um, Indigenous sort of don't really like um, formal meetings. They, they prefer to be sitting around a fire and just sort of talking and just having a chat because we learn a lot um, when we're relaxed. Um, you know, this meeting's, this meeting's quite um, good. Um, what can I say? Um, my background is from, um, uh, from 30 years ago, I decided to uh, try and design a, uh, a business model which employed people with disabilities uh, without funding. Um, over that period of time, I've employed probably, I don't know, maybe 100, 150 people um, in regards to, to employing um, people like this nature. And um, it's been really rewarding. It's, and um, I've, had a lot of, I've lot, had a lot of enjoyment over that period of time. What I did realise is that within my industry, which is um, a very simple sort of industry, which is lawn mowing, gardening, um, that type of thing. A lot of the a lot of the issues which I, I sort of uh, grappled with was how do you actually get um, people who are um, I suppose with disabilities or uh, on the poverty line into mainstream work, and um, anyhow that sort of led me on this journey which I thought was only going to last me seven years, but it ended up thirty years. Then I sort of went, well, where do I go from here? And I thought, well. In lawn mowing and gardening, it's not really what I feel as though is, is necessary on the coast. And I went back to my roots and went, well, what is it? And I went fishing. Uh, fishing water is a, is a connection of how you can actually encourage um, um, people and policy change um, because uh, Indigenous people on the coast really are passionate about um, the water resource and how that water resource is used. Um, hence, um, I moved into um, and um, went along the lines of developing and helping develop Chunga. So, um, and this is where we're at today. So, yeah. I'm going to bounce in here to ask Rob some questions. We'll run it in a casual, okay. in a casual way. So, um, Rob, can you talk us through a little bit what your vision for Chunga is? Where, where do you see it? Um, Junga is an interesting sort of mix. It's it's like a, a collaboration between, um, I suppose, all sorts of disciplines that uh, bring together bring together an outcome that is going to be sustainable. I suppose that's that's probably the easiest way you can sort of put it. Um, and within those disciplines, we're we're going across all sorts of fields here. Um, you know, all the academic side of things, but then you've also got the cultural side of things traditional owner side of things, um, native title, um, it goes on and on. So I suppose the cauldron at this point in time is, is from my perspective, is Junga. So, yeah. Mm. And so what role do you see Junga is playing in the Indigenous community on the South Coast? Uh, from my perspective, I'd like to see Junga as a standalone business that um, can offer, I suppose, a, um, I suppose a guidance of um, good collaborative um, design um, around business models and attitudes um, and culture. 
um, so that other um, tri tri uh, tribes or um, anybody can actually look at it and go, hang on a minute, this is actually a, a very interesting model which we'd like to um, see whether we could uh, use and, um, and um, expand on. So what are the lessons that you've learned from your own business development process in your business that you see being transferable into Joomla? Uh, there's, oh God, <laughs> um, there's many. Um, I, I don't really know where to start with that one because um, it, it's simple but it's not simple because there's little twigs which go along that actually change the way um, business operates. One thing that does come to mind is, is that with business, business has always been sort of built around how do you actually get people to work? Um, and this is the model I've got and this is the model you've got to fit into. Whereas when I looked at that model, I went, hang on, that doesn't work from a cultural perspective because it's usually the other way around. It's um, you've got an individual that wants to actually participate in work but wants to do it the way they want to do it. So when you go and look at that sort of side of it and start to reverse the business process and go, okay, how do we design business around a person for their specific needs, that's when it starts to get um, very interesting because you've got all different types of people doing, wanting to do all different types of things. Um, you might have some people which actually want to work two, three days a week. Um, then you might have other people which want to say, look, I want to build a mega company. Um, so you have to have a model which can facilitate sort of both ends of the spectrum. So Rob's being very um, modest here. He has um, won awards for his business in uh, for how it's developed as a social enterprise around, particularly around the, the disability sector. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, could, could you explain a little bit more about what was so innovative about that approach that kind of got got you this recognition? Um, I'm bloody stubborn. <laughs> Um, I, the first thing I thought of is when I started to look at this, I looked at how can government help me? And um, the more I dug into it, the more I realised that government actually said to me, well, look, you know, the way we can help you is we will actually, um, we could give you money. If we give you money, then we actually have a stake in it and we then decide on how to um, uh, release that money as you reach your goals. And I thought, no, you, how, how do you do that? Because you, you can't really create because it's, it's actually creating in a way that is uh, manipulated by government. So I went, no, stuff that. I'm going to go and stand on my own two feet and do it on my own. So I sort of thought along those lines. Then I went into the other side of it, which was um, employment. And uh, the same thing came up where I went to the employment agency. The employment agency said, oh, look, we can offer you X amount of dollars if you go and employ a uh, person with a disability and all that sort of thing. And and um, that's all you've got to do is really employ them for X amount of days and um, then you'll get this lump sum of payment. And I thought about that for a while and I uh, dug a bit deeper into it and I realised that um, uh, a lot of businesses, I'm not saying all, I'm just saying that the way the system's set up, it, uh, it, it sort of works against people who have got disabilities um, by employing them for over a period of so many months or weeks or whatever it might be, and then they get the money and then that person then actually moves on to another, um, they get removed from the business and then move on and then that cycle starts again. So that person with the disability then has this, um, I suppose, um, they're more entrenched in becoming um, um, unemployed because they feel as though they're not worthy of any. So what we did is we went, no, bugger this. We'll pay them an award wage or an above award wage. We will look at how a business can actually fit into their particular um, situation and um, went from there. And that's, I think that's the reason why they sort of gave us the award. So yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't see any, any, difference in it really because i've just lived it for so long i just don't really it doesn't worry me really. um tillman how much time have we got i've got lots of questions but i <laughs> conscious of time oh we, we have um if you want to go to 
one or ask ask a few questions absolutely keep going keep going okay um well i guess i mean to, to i guess to wrap it up I, I, the big question is where what's your what's your vision like what would you like to see happen on the coast in say five ten years what what would you like the landscape to look like uh, it'd be it'd be absolutely wonderful to actually see that um people who are less fortunate have the opportunity to explore um, working in the mainstream environment in the way they want to work in it um, and to provide a platform that offers that opportunity and the support um, to actually give people a hand up rather than handouts. Um, yeah, that's pretty, it, mm. pretty much it. So the knowledge that Rob's built up from that experience of building a business in the disability sector one of the things I guess which struck me when we were having our conversation was how similar the governance systems around managing disability and managing Aboriginal communities actually overlaps, which is... Yeah, it's, it's quite funny actually. It's, it's almost a replica from what I see. Um, and all they've done really is put band-aids on, the, on, the, um, on that particular area to, to actually uh, suffice for Indigenous so the way I looked at it was is that pretty much um, Indigenous are classified as, in my terms, like I said, as they, they're also, they've also got a disability as well. So, and that, that's it's just a very interesting sort of um, world we're living in when it, when it comes to how you cut and paste and sort of develop things so that you don't have to do too much. So I think that's why uh, here at UIW we're quite excited about working with Junga over the next few years, hopefully, to <laughs> achieve achieve the vision that Rob's got. Because um, I think what's really um, innovative and exciting about it is that it starts to flip that that way of thinking of you know the, yeah. addressing a problem to actually working on a from a position of strength that. Yeah, it, it takes it takes a lot. It takes a lot of it takes a lot of um, organisations to actually make change. And if you can actually um, bring all these organisations together, thinking about the same goal, um, well, then what you do is you get um, a very interesting mix of of well, what is possible. So you you just you don't know we're, we're treading on ground here which is um all very innovative so yeah it's exciting excellent any final words before i hand back to Tom? uh no not really I just yeah I, I, just everybody just when you when you're sort of working just always think about um what is actually going on behind the scenes when it comes to policy making <laughs> and look at uh, how how people can actually make change when it comes to uh, trying to help people um, in the world of um, unemployment. Great, thanks, Rob. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. Look, the when you were talking, it just took me back to Raglan, New Zealand. They used to have a shoe manufacturer there that uh, they would only open their manufacturing when it was low tide because high tide everyone was out surfing so they wrapped their whole business model around the lifestyle which i just was unfortunately they didn't last but uh, it was a it was a great, great way of looking at, at work-life balance um i also told my wife already that we are moving down to naruma right because there's a lot so much work down there uh she hasn't agreed yet i'm i'm keep working on that <laughs> And uh, but I want to also introduce our next uh, next speaker. Um, Ewan is here with us, um, and Hugh already mentioned that uh, oyster farmer, and he's actually sitting in his office. And I've I've been in his office, and I'm so jealous of it. But when we introduce these uh, these sensor technology to you and you, his mind went like da 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 because he's not only an oyster farmer because also a tech startup entrepreneur, and suddenly it's like oh you can send this you can send that and then you know with Hugh we also had this idea of an eye oyster um, which is still progressing and yeah we were really here uh, really keen to hear from you you and about your business and what you're doing and. Uh, 
how you how you see the blue futures rolling out on the south coast thanks Tillman. um yeah so, uh, obviously I'm excited to be here um i love love rob's love to hear about rob's business just then uh, I, I'm an oyster farmer down at Batemans Bay on the Clyde River. I've been doing it for 16 years. But over the 16 years, I've, you know, been forced to, or, or I've, I've sort of um, been forced to solve problems around oyster farming. And I will also say that um, part of that journey, and I might just play a little video, because I've just done a video recently. I did a presentation video that really sums up the, my, my journey, you know, as a, as a farmer and now now as a, a tech startup um, CEO. But um, what I will say is that I, when I was young and I started oyster farming, I went oyster farming because I wanted to be on the water. It was as simple as that. But what, what over the years is you get older, you have kids, you know, I'm real, I, I realise I'm really, how amazing, you know, shellfish, seaweed and the potential of, you know, sustainable seafood production has for, you know, I would, I would call about providing great food, but also like um, livelihoods and lives. Like what we, what we, what we are attracted to on the South Coast is that, is the nature and the water. So, you know, if we can, I don't want to jump ahead to any of your questions, but, you know, I see a future where, you know, we have a thriving sort of sustainable seafood industry and, and in doing so really, we really, um, you know, protect what we've got down here as well as, you know, engage the whole community in, in, in it in terms of working and growing. But I'll play this video and, um, and from that, you know, happy, happy to answer questions. Just uh, let me share the screen. Just give me a shout out to them. G'day everybody, my name's Ewan McCash. I am a 2012 Nuffield Scholar and an oyster farmer from Browley, New South Wales. I studied marine biology at university and I've been oyster farming now for more than 16 years. My scholarship study topic was the importance of strategic planning to grow the oyster industry. During my travels, I observed that successful businesses and industries were never insular. Cooperatives, partnerships and collaboration were where the big gains were. At the floor of Holland, that was the cash cry. First we collaborate uh, and then we compete. And I think this is particularly important for a small industry such as New South Wales Oysters. After 10 years of farming uh, and enough of scholarship, I now realise that my farming business will never truly thrive unless my whole industry is thriving and that's as well. What have I been doing since my Nuffield scholarship? Well, I've been launching new companies, companies that solve problems for my farming business, but also for the industry as well. I'm wearing all the hats. Oyster Life, which is how we've scaled up my family farm. It's a share farming company. I'm Jace Finlay, part owner in Oyster Life. We're a management company, so we operate through a single farm but share farm with five other farmers. And we have Signature Oysters, which is our online sales and direct restaurant marketing company. And this company made us particularly resilient during the last 18 months of lockdown. We produce oysters to top restaurants. We have about 60 restaurants Australia-wide, and also we sell big volumes to wholesalers and Smart Oysters, which is a farm operations application for running smart um, oyster farms. Farming is a challenging business, let alone farming underwater. The location, the tide, the wind, waves and weather all provide a unique challenge to every aquaculture farm. Through time, experience and sometimes sheer grit, an oyster farmer will customise their cultivation method, their scheduled tasks of grading, drying and selling in order to solve the unique challenges of their farm location. That is a lot of information for a farmer to remember, but that's exactly what most farmers do. The locations of thousands of oyster baskets, schedules and tasks remembered by one person. I've been an oyster farmer for 15 years. Over that time, I developed better cultivation methods and established new premium markets for my farm. It was during the growth of the business that I discovered the magnitude of the issue I was facing. After years of farming, I had created an environment where I was the only person who truly knew what to do and when to do it. 
All the history, all the best practice was in my head. I'd become trapped as a farm manager, working the business day to day. My efforts to grow the business became a burden, not an opportunity. Farmers doesn't just make farming easier, it changes farmers' lives for better. Productivity and profits then flow from that. Smart Oysters uses GPS maps and customizable reports to capture the farmer's unique farm practice. It notifies you when your next grade is due, it assigns tasks for maintenance, it keeps track of where your gear and oysters are. It helps you bring on your staff. In doing so, Smart Oysters also captures information needed to make the business more efficient, more scalable, more investable. But most importantly, if you're a farmer, it lets you sleep at night. Traditional management systems prioritise the collection of data. Smartless is different. We prioritise the needs of the farmer. But primarily for me, it's, it's actually knowing what's on those farms. Before, we used to run around on the barge, get off and check every row, and every bag, every second bag to see what condition they are. This way you don't have to. This way you just punch it up on your phone and where you go. I can but this rack's broken and it needs to repair. But it's the app that doesn't let anything slip by. Nothing's ever going to get left because your app's telling you that this batch in this position is ready to be picked up. Smart Oyster app captures the way you run the farm and also gives you a snapshot of the total value of your farm. So that's great for being able to go and talk to banks or investors as to being able to raise more capital to grow the business. Our solution is turning heads in other industries, with pilot programs running on mussel, finfish and seaweed farms. It's exciting to know that these aquaculture industries also need our solution. Smart Oyster's vision is to create a better world, one farm at a time. By this we mean creating better lives, better livelihoods, better produce and a better environment. And that's exactly what Smart Oyster's is already doing across the globe today. One of the challenges my industry faces is access to growth capital. There's huge demand for what we grow, sustainable seafood, and a huge opportunity to grow our production. However, unlike land farming, we cannot use our aquaculture leases as assets to borrow against. How are we going to solve this? Well, we're going to use our farm data and technology to access new, more innovative forms of finance. In fact, we've already started to do this using the Smart Oysters platform. Thanks, Till. Thanks, guys. That's uh, hope that summed up the journey uh, for everyone, and I'm yeah, open to questions. Every round in this rifle. Could... So I might kick this off because like some people might be uh, a bit. Uh, disheartened by it because you're taking the romance out of the oyster industry. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, it, it's a good pickup, Tim, because I, I guess, yeah, it, it is, that's exactly what, as, as, as it's described, like I started farming, you know, 16 years ago and, you know, it, it is very romantic and you get out there and you're a farmer and you learn, you learn how to farm your patch you know, and, and, you, and you only learn through experience and, 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 the, and the continual changing environment. Um, but unfortunately, when it comes to growing the industry, when it, when it comes to actually bringing on people and, and trying to share that knowledge, you know, keeping it all your head just doesn't work. Um, and, and what, I mean, what's funny is that when I first started looking for solutions and not finding them and having to develop smart oysters, is that we, my co-founders really talk about, oh yeah, imagine one day, you know, with sensors and, and technology and farm practice, you know, you could have a farm that could run itself. And I was like, no way, there's no way. There's so much moving parts to farming and um, especially oyster farming where you're growing oysters over a long period of time, two to three years and, um, and the shifting environment. But you know what, it, once you start sort of, collecting that information and, you know, digitizing farm practice, you realize, yeah, actually we can make this easier. It's not about replacing farmers, but it is about making it easier in terms of farming and, and sharing that farm knowledge. And, and yeah, I, I, even, I, even when you guys came down, we started talking census, you know, we're ready to have that conversation now because we understand, you know, that farming's about 
doing activities you know, in, at, at, at locations you know, at certain times. Like that's what it sort of comes down to. And if, you know, sensors mean that I can enjoy a Christmas lunch because I know that my oysters aren't baking in the heat, um, then, you know, that's, that's a good thing, you know, and that's something we can build into the smart oysters. Doesn't that also mean that <clears throat> you might move up to Sydney CBD, sit in a, sit in a big tower, you know, 20 screens in front of you, just trying to manage all of these farms and totally detached from country? <laughs> I don't think so because you know what's for me. I don't think so because you know it, it just means I don't think so because you know the road. What is the romance about oyster farming? It's getting on the water. So I don't think we're ever going to take the you know getting on the water out of the farmer. Um, but you know what's amazing to what's amazing to see as well is you would have seen my two brothers-in-law, Jason, Jamie, on the boat in that film. They co-founded Oyster Life with me, and. At the time, we've all got we've got young families, and you know a real priority for us was to have time with our family. So both Jason and Jamie only work a four day week, so they've been able to take I've been able to share my farming knowledge with them through that application. You can see that we've also invested in really nifty new cultivation methods. But yeah, those guys work four days a week. You know they have one day off to look after their their kids and be part of their family. And yet they're growing twice as many oysters as I did when I worked seven days a week and they're making, you know, they've got a sustainable, profitable business. So, um, and, you know, employing more people. So it's just, it, you know, it, it, it's but the potential raglan story to them in terms of what you could do with technology, you know, is, is make more sustainable, friendly businesses. And I'm pretty sure you still can get delivery from signature oysters for your Christmas lunch, is it? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, there's, there's lots wrapped up in, in, our, in the business. So, and it, so the quick story is that because I started farming um, and then as we started farming, we realized we were, you know, we weren't enough making enough money, I guess, from the wholesale market. So, so in an effort to sort of connect closer with customers and, and chefs um, and the people who eat oysters, we actually created signature oysters and, And Signature Oysters now um, sends uh, boxes of oysters, unopened oysters all over Australia, so you can purchase them online, um, sends them to both you know, people's homes and also to restaurants. And, and each box comes with, you know, a story of the farmer that grew the oysters uh, and, you know, where they're located, etc. cetera. So, um, yeah, and that, that's been, as mentioned in the video, it made us particularly resilient last year when, We, yeah, we did could pivot from just supplying restaurants directly to actually, you know, supplying oysters online, packing smaller boxes with a lemon and a knife. And, and turns out, you know, there, there's a great business out there and lots of people want to you know, learn. At the time when everyone was in lockdown, they were ready to learn how to open their own oysters. So it's been, it's been a fantastic thing. And I also saw your innovative water tanks that kind of uh, form a bit of a decoupling. So if you, If you have you opened your bar yet at, at the oyster farm? No, no, not yet. Not, okay. Not, not too many other things on. Um, no. But yeah, that that was. I mean, that was one thing. Is that you know, hot, so oysters grow. You know, naturally. You know, we don't have to feed them or treat them, but they're filter feeders, so they're feeding on the plankton and, and, and the organic matter that's in in the river. Um, when we have rainfall, like we've had recently, the Uh, the, the river is shut as a precaution and then we wait for it to clear and we test the water before we start harvesting again. Um, when, you, when you are talking, when you, you know, to have that consistent supply and be able to you know, you know, keep the business sort of running, you know, we've actually invested in you know, wet storage tanks. So it's the same technology that, you, that, that was built for you know, premium seafood that we have here on the South Coast, like lobsters and abalone. Uh, we're just now co-opting it for, for oysters. It's working out really well. Then Isn't that part of sensor technology right there to understand the water qualities in the estuary and, and where, where do you interface with uh, DPI and, and other organizations, the government? Yeah, sure. And that, so we're, there's, a, there's a water quality aspect to, you know, understanding when the river might open, when it might close. Um, we do have sensors in the river that, that tell us when the salinities come up high enough for us to go and test. So we've already sort of, we've, been the industry has been involved in in sensing has had sensors in the industry probably for the last five six maybe even ten years 
um, what's happening now is just really integrating integrating that sensors into you know farm activities and just making it really easy on a, on a day to day basis for the farmer to make decisions. So not necessarily looking at data, you know, graphs or, or, or you know time series of data, but just getting alert that hey your oysters are hot or the salinity is dropping, so that farmers can make real time decisions. Rainfall rates, you know, really excited about things like when it's raining. If we, if we have management plans from the river and we have to shut after 30 or 40 mils of rain, well, that can happen in two days. You're never really quite sure as the rain's falling how quickly that could happen. So, yeah, that, that's the kind of, the kind of things we can explore with sensors. Yeah, just so Georgia has one question here. Do you find the uptake of new technologies even, even across the board or are the new generation farmers more open to it? It's the, I think for, we, we have this sort of, often, often we'll say that, you know, oyster farmers tend to take, take on new technology or, or make their minds up about new things as fast as their oysters grow. And oysters don't grow necessarily that fast. So there are, it is a bit, but, but what I would say, in, what I would say is that just farming in general, it's slow to make change, you know, to roll out new systems across a farm is it, quite slow. You know, the, the, the farm is underwater. You know, so it's not a matter of like getting out, getting out there. You, you're working with the tides and weather. So, uh, but but the best analogy I'll say is that you know, ten, oh yeah, about ten years ago, um, you know, we, as part of modernising our oyster farm, we bought an oyster grater, something that sizes the oysters and does it quite quickly. You know, traditionally you would just size them by hand, you know, um, and grade them you know, by hand. Now, when we bought that. Um, there was a lot of crossed arms in, you know, of farmers looking at, at it when we demoed it. Uh, but now, 10 years later, every oyster farm has an automatic grader. So, yeah, so I would say that, no, like it's an industry that's ready to take up technology quite fast. And actually, when I talk about, when you think about that also, that, that last point I made in my little video about one of the challenges um, aquaculture has is the, is the lack of growth capital. So because you can't borrow money against your oyster leases or your you know, in your water, it, it is, you actually end up borrowing against your house, you know, or, um, or, not, or, or getting quite expensive finance. So that's a real challenge. That's probably the biggest challenge, I would say, is not the actual farmers wanting to uptake technology, it's actually finding that capital so that you're not, you know, that's how we grew my farm. I, um, I mortgaged my parents' house, you know, and, and, when, and when we paid that back and we wanted to expand the farm, I wasn't prepared to do that for my family because it's so stressful. So mm. uh, that's where the oyster life share farm model came out of. Is, is it's how we've managed to do it. We've brought in external investors that have bought the leases and the oyster baskets, and then us young young guys with the the drive, and the energy. You know, we're using our capital to actually grow oysters across those leases. So. I have a final question for you. It's probably a, a bit of a curly one, but. Um trying to uh, also go back to, to Rob's comments earlier. In your, in your video, you showed a lot of New Zealand um, oyster farmers. They are, there's, a, there's a strong presence of um, indigenous farmers uh, in business, south coast of New Zealand, like the Marlboro Sounds and that reason, the green lip muscle stuff. How can we improve the betting average? Because I didn't see a lot of local indigenous businesses having a similar presence uh, on the south coast yeah that's it's um i i it's, just, it's something we i mean that's, that's how i answer this we have um i sorry, think sorry, it's, about, it's, about, no, it's about it's about being <laughs> it's, right, it's right to rob's point it's about being more innovative and more flexible. Oyster life is already going down that track about changing the mindset about farming is seven days a week. You turn up at a certain time and you work to a certain time, you know, and there's no flexibility around that. You know, we've, it's about having more sort of flexible, you know, businesses that, that change around people's lifestyles and needs. So I think, and to be honest, there's an amazing opportunity, you know, for, for oyster farming or seaweed farming or the blue future of the south coast it can can build those models in there which is actually like you know, build it for the people not for the, the, the balance sheet or, or, or this traditional model so um and, and and as you see like me for me to be able to like 
for me to be able to share my knowledge using the Smart Oysters app or by digitizing what I knew, it, it allowed Jason Janey, who had no experience of farming, to come in quite quickly and farm a whole lot more efficiently and more sustainably than even I could. So, you know, there's a, there's a tech aspect to it. There's a, a mindset aspect to it. A lot of older farmers laugh when, I talk, when they hear that we only work four days a week, you know, it's so lazy, you know, and yet for us, it's like, I don't think we'd get, I don't think we'd make, I don't think it'd make any difference if we worked a fifth day, we wouldn't get any more done. You know, the guys come in for four days a week and they're really excited, pump it out, you know, like really, really work hard and then they can go relax, you know, with their family and it's, you know, they're not, a, you know, they're, they're better off for it. So. And if you don't know, there's a, there's a big competition between Bateman Bay oysters and Marimula boat oysters and I don't make that judgment call. You got to go down the coast and find out yourself which one, which ones are better. <laughs> They're all good. They're all, They're all good. They're all good. tasty. Yes, absolutely. Thanks so much, Ian, for your for your for your talk today. And I think you're right. The Blue Futures needs to provide meaningful space down the south coast and be more inclusive. And I'm really looking forward to working with you moving forward because. That, that eye oyster thing, the, the, the technology we're talking about, uh, we're heaps keen to, to work with you on that project. Um, Got mine here, if I could flash it back. <laughs> you, you didn't give it back, that's right. <laughs> um, I now want to introduce Pia, Pia Winberg. I first met Pia in a talk at AIM here at Innovation Campus. And she, she told very bluntly that she said, like, see, we can uh, save the world. And uh, when she finished with her talk, I said, yep, see, we was going to save the world. Uh, I'm convinced. It was, was easy to convince me. But uh, um, it's really so interesting how she, how she brings the science into seaweed farming. And uh, we looked at her store in uh, Haskinson, yes. So you got all these beautiful places on the south coast and I sit on innovation campus. This is, uh, this is not fair. So you, you actually found a really beautiful place down there. And I remember going into your, into your store, we wanted to have a chat about Blue Futures, all things, and we ended up spending a lot of money in your, in your, in your seaweed store. And I think I raised some expectations in my wife for Christmas. Um, but yeah, so I'm working not directly with Pia, but through TRICEP, our translational research initiative, on that uh, 3D bioprinting where we're using Pia's uh, scientifically farmed seaweed uh, for, to improve health outcomes for, for our communities. And I pass over to, to Pia and to tell us a bit more about her operation. I also saw there is smart seaweed, so there seems to be a link with, with Ewan, and uh, I'm pretty sure there's also a link to Rob somewhere that he might be able to explain, and if not, that's okay. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thanks, Tilman. And um, yeah, I might jump straight into a, a presentation here um, and, <clears throat> and uh, what we do. Um, and uh, reflect a little bit as I go on. On yeah, we we do collaborate with Ewan, and we will continue to collaborate with Ewan. And I think that the South Coast um, journey is one, as Ewan was saying before, of collaboration. And and in our case, Ewan, I don't think that seaweeds and oysters will ever compete. I think we'll collaborate forever. <laughs> but um, but um, and Tillman did ask me, you know, what's one of the things I'd like to see. Um, in, in the future, and it is the fruits of the collaborations really haven't been um, close to realised yet. And uh, I think I need another 50 years of life beyond what I might still have left to, to um, yeah, take on all the ideas that, that um, and, and opportunities that exist collaboratively. But um, hopefully generations ahead of us on the South Coast um, will will be able to have a, a, a legacy of, of some opportunities in the space of, of marine industries. So um, yeah, so I'm just, I'm speaking, I'm an honorary fellow at the University of Wollongong um, still, and I collaborate as an industry partner at the University of Wollongong, but I'm not an academic anymore. I'm, I now started running Venus Shell Systems, which has established um, 
a seaweed farm on the south coast uh, here in, in Bomaderry, Shoalhaven Estuary actually, and also my brand FICO Health in our factory is in Huskisson. So that's the consumer facing brand of the products that we make from, from our seaweeds. Um, and uh, the, the farm here that you can see is, is along the Shoalhaven Estuary for a few reasons. One is the salt water. Um, because it's a salt water industry and we don't need to grow this crop with any fresh water at all. Um, and also because we have the opportunity to integrate and collaborate with um, another industry, which is the Manildra Group, and they ferment uh, wheat, wheat um, to uh, ethanol, the, the 10 that's in your E10 um, fuel. Um, and uh, when they ferment that, there's a natural exhaled carbon dioxide that we capture and we can grow the seaweed very fast. Um, and they also digest the washed down nutrient from, from the processing. Um, and we uh, digest that again to dissolve nutrients and we can capture that. Our mission on this site is to be at least three hectares because on a three hectare farm, we could eliminate all of the nutrient loads that Manildra have in the catchment there um, and, and pretty much relieve the coastline of the nitrogen phosphorus loads that, that are uh, beyond the normal capacity. So there's a lot of uh, chemistry um, behind the technology and ideas, um, a lot of biology and amazing uh, evolution in the seaweed that we grow, uh, and then uh, innovation and engineering and different systems that we put on top of that chemistry and biology um, to develop um, uh, what I hope will be a, a blossoming industry here on the South Coast. As I mentioned before, this is a sort of illustration of, of how we work. We go straight from natural, this is just say it's like a, going from your kitchen to your compost and the compost goes onto your cabbage patch and on terrestrial systems. It's a little bit like that, but we work in, in a bigger scale because we have to pump in seawater and the nutrients here are concentrated at scale. Um, we use nature's uh, ecological services and uh, in, in a pool and in in an engineered setting. Um, and the products we can make uh, so many things from. Um, and that's the opportunity that is what we do today, but also beyond what we can do in our own company. So our technology is sort of a vertical chain. We, we produce seaweed. Um, you can see our nursery cultures in the background. We grow our seaweed by remediating nutrients and integrating with other systems. Um, and then we extract, and you can see here, this is the extract in my hands that we purify and work with um, tricep that Tillman mentioned before, and that we've tailored into a 3D printable bio ink to, to print um, human cells with, and I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, and we also have market ready products, corn chips and other things for people to eat today. That's been really important for me, is that you can always be talking as an academic blue sky, blue sky, but you need to show that there's uh, reality on the ground and opportunity today. And so getting to market and selling um, now has been really important to us. So this is just a little a bit of a consolidation of that vertical chain is that we grow a very particular type of um, Australian seaweed. We can control that production and we can grow it at a rate of about 100 tonnes per hectare uh, in a year. If you compare that to other crops, on land, uh, like wheat, most crops, they're less than five tonnes per hectare in a year. So you can imagine we're 50 times more productive than some of the um, traditional crops that we've got. And if we can start to um, um, supplement and the, the traditional um, crops with, with our seaweed, so you know, if we look at 10% seaweed in pasta, which is what we do, 10% of the wheat we've replaced in Australia would be a million hectares of land that that wheat is farmed on with freshwater resources. So we can relieve the pressure on land ecosystems um, in growing this seaweed. And we have now developed an extraction process that um, is specific for this seaweed and the molecules that we pull out. Here you can see some of the different pigments, uh, proteins, and the, the bioinks that we're extracting. And lucky for us, this bioink was, was very similar to human connective tissue, which is why we're using it in the biotech space. Um, but you can see here what we're in the market with today is in food, we've got skincare products, we've done clinical studies in collaboration with the University of Wollongong on gut health. And only just this year we've released um, with our partners down here at, at kombucha and fermented um, seaweed beverages as well. 
<clears throat> and here you can just see an array of the opportunities. Now, we can't do everything, but we sort of had to prove the point that seaweed can save the world, like Kilman said, we can put it in everything. Indeed, photosynthesis, I say, is the foundation of everything, even oysters, Ewan. And, um, and, uh, and, and that's powering a whole lot of opportunity. So that's what I want to illustrate on the South Coast is it's, it's our company, but also many other uh, businesses in the future that value add, um, further develop um, our seaweed biomass and other seaweed biomass into a range of products. Here you can see the first four that are already in the market today. And these are available online. We've now um, launched into the Harris Farm market chain with our food products. And uh, we've just exported our first shipment to the UK. Um, but then here are our future opportunities on the right. So we've done research with um, the University of Wollongong. We were on the front cover of the Biomaterial Science Journal this year, where one of the PhD students with Gordon has developed a bioink and we've uh, reproduced full thickness skin tissue from that technology in the lab and now looking to do clinical studies with it. Here you can see um, Aquafeed. We've actually used our seaweed in um, feed for abalone, which, which now in farming use land crops. So further pressure on the land, um, wheat, corn, chicken even in aquafeeds um, for abalone. And we've had, had a PhD student at the Uni of Wollongong where we showed that we could actually turn abalone back into seafood by elevating omega-3 in the abalone when we include seaweed in the diet. Um, and here's a film of some of that biomaterial that we extract for the, for the wound healing work. <clears throat> here's just an illustration um, because I'm collaborating a little bit with Tillman through, through Tricep at the University of Wollongong, which is at the Innovation Campus there. Um, this, these are images here of um, uh, fluorescence on collagen one. You can see here on the right, these are scaffolds we've printed with different formulations of these bio inks. So these are 3D printed three-dimensional scaffolds and then seeded with human skin cells. And here you can see that those skin cells start attaching and thriving and they can grow. This is collagen type one, collagen type three, different fibronectin and elastin that makes the skin elastic. So all of these um, molecules in the skin have, have been produced by the cells because they, they attach and grow really well on these scaffolds that we've developed. Um, and, and then that led to um, this, this is in this publication, um, the, the growth of full thickness uh, skin tissue in this case. So here's uh, on the top is, is skin without our seaweed extract. And in this paper, we could show that the seaweed, the, the scaffold with our seaweed extract actually allowed the cells to have better structure. And this is one of the things that Fiona Wood in Western Australia is is looking for in that she developed the uh, human skin spray and has saved lives amazingly. But her next vision is that those people's lives who've been saved will have more functional skin um, and happier lives with, with stretchier skin, better elastin, better direction of the skin cells. Um, and so this is a little bit of the, the blue sky stuff that we'd like to aim for, but these collaborations um, are really exciting and can be facilitated because we're growing this unique um, seaweed and purifying this very unique molecule from our local coastline. And the University of Wollongong has the capacity to take it to, to this level of um, science as well. So it's really exciting to have that level of collaboration. I will put this here just because you need to be careful what you wish for and working in factories and labs and doing that sort of thing, you might've heard, ended up in me being scalped totally from, from uh, some of my seaweed extraction machines actually. But um, this was not the reason I started doing wound healing research, but it is a reason that I still find it even more fascinating than I did at the beginning. But the core goal of why I started doing this, because I'm a marine systems ecologist, um, was, was about sustainability and the impact seaweed can have um, <clears throat> and from a remediation, cleaning up, and a circular economy kind of concept. Um, seaweed, as I said before, is the foundation of everything we know in life. Uh, well, photosynthesis is the foundation of that. And seaweed was the first organisms to strip, um, and seaweed and algae, the first organisms to strip carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and actually create um, the oxygen rich planet that we live on today. We're going to have to do that pretty fast to, um, to recover from the state that we're in today where we've burnt all of that photosynthesis up over the past years. But 
we need to start now and doing that. So our vision over the next um, over the next uh, year, months, years, and decades, uh, we're just here at the beginning, and we would like to get to at least eight hectares um, of a farm on the south coast in Bomaderry. Like Ewan was saying, though, financing these things is a challenge because you're breaking new ground. Banks don't understand it. Uh, it's in part why we go to market immediately to show we're not making this up. People will buy seaweed and they used to historically and, and they will again. Um, then we've got uh, other sites that we've found organic waste streams that we can look at creating circular economies with in other states um, that we could expand to around Australia. And in a global point of view, seaweed is really taking off around the world. Norway is investing in it heavily. Um, the UK is investing in it heavily in offshore systems. There'll be many types of seaweed systems. But I say, why can't seaweed be at least 10% the size of the Australian wheat industry and indeed global food production? Because if you're 10% of food production, and in Japan, many places do eat 10% seaweed in their diet, uh, you know, you'll be um, saving 250 million hectares of land so much water, fresh water, which will become a very limited, is a very limited resource. Uh, well, not this week or month, maybe, or summer, but usually it's a limited resource. Um, and, um, and masses of greenhouse gases prevented because we are not manufacturing fertilizers. We're capturing wasted nutrient streams and putting them back into biomass straight away. And we have zero waste. We don't have roots, shoots or anything. We just produce clean seawater and oxygen from our process system. So that's a sort of a summary of, of, um, of uh, what we do and what we want to do. Uh, we have our farms, we're focusing on our products and scaling and generating revenue that way. We've got global sustainable development goals, but we also have fun and, and excitement about the um, area of biotech and biomaterials that that we can embrace. Um, so that's the sort of journey we're at the very beginning of, and, and I hope it's part of the Blue Futures that um, you know this, this uh, Global Challenges program has identified as an opportunity for the whole region on the South Coast. Absolutely amazing work. How long did it take you to get there? <laughs> um, it's, I think it's a, it's, yeah, it didn't happen. People see you now and go, oh, you're an overnight success. Yeah, just thought of it last year. No, it, it's, um, I would say that the journey, when did it start? It's really a lifetime experience that leads you to somewhere. And, you know, this first time seaweed came to me was over 20 years ago now. And it's not always that you, the journey belongs inside a business because there was a lot of research and development and understanding and, um, local opportunities and the community on the south coast opportunities you know the whole south coast here and i moved to Ulladulla now 20 years ago and Ulladulla was one of the major seafood fishing ports in in the state um and and has struggled and, and reduced now because of um fisheries management and some overfishing and that it's now at a, a more managed well managed um level but it's an area that can't really expand so the opportunities for the south coast um uh, have been one of the drivers because I saw, wow, they need something new down here. And so maybe what I learned in Sri Lanka and Stockholm University, um, I went to Sri Lanka to look at how to clean up tiger prawn farming, which was an economic opportunity for countries like Sri Lanka, but an environmental disaster in the way that they did it. And so I looked at how did the water chemistry work and seaweed was being used there to make a circular ecological system in tiger prawn farming. Um, and that's where it came to me first. And then I realized, wow, seaweed is the missing link in cleaning up aquaculture. And then I probably spent 10 years looking at uh, seaweed there to clean up aquaculture. Um, but then after 10 years realizing, hmm, that's not gonna create a business. No one's paying to clean up the world apparently. So now I need to look at, well, what can seaweed be used for? So at the University of Wollongong, I started to look at nutrition and health and clinical studies, collaborate still with Imri and the um, and the uh, School of, um, of Medicine there. And I also collaborate with chemistry at the University of Wollongong um, to look at um, well, what are the opportunities to address some of the chronic malnourishment in the world, including in Australia. We still are deficient in iodine and iron. Uh, you know, the seaweed we grow is very rich in bioavailable iron. And um, 
anemia is or iron deficiency is still a leading cause of maternal deaths in the world. About 20% of people in maternal deaths in India are from iron deficiency. Um, and, and that could be overcome with our kind of seaweed in chocolate every week for every day for, for six weeks. So, um, so those sorts of uh, nutritional global health challenges are really important. And seaweed is such a simple answer. Iodine as well is iodine deficiency is the leading cause of brain damage in the world today, according to the World Health Organization. And if all you did was have a little bit of our seaweed salt or a fuka by your stove, we would eliminate one of the leading causes of brain damage in the world. You don't, we don't need rocket science for that. So Michelle, the present, well, the things you're getting this afternoon will we'll be able to, you know, uh, help a brain, support brain and, and, um, and, um, and hormone function in, in, in people. And those things have been missing from the Western uh, diets for, for too long and led to many of our chronic health disorders, diabetes included. So, so these are, um, Sort of, you know, keep it simple, stupid solutions, and go back to the fundamentals of what um, health is about. Um, oysters are a great thing, for example. Omega three deficiency is is uh, is rife in Australia. Uh, we did with the University of Wollongong and Barbara Meyer at the School of Medicine. We've done uh, clinical studies in the local prisons, and we showed that the deficiency of omega three in prisoners is higher than the average um, on the street uh, because there's obviously a legacy of of not as good nutrition in the prison population. Um, and we also showed that the uh, omega-3 in the prisoner's blood was negatively correlated with aggression and impulsive behavior because omega-3 is a really important molecule in driving brain signaling functions. And if you don't have omega-3, which you can only get from your food, then your brain just can't operate properly. And oysters are fantastic because even though algae and seaweed produce the omega-3, it's not so concentrated. And an oyster at Christmas will have an amazing dose of, of omega-3. We've also looked at when oysters have most omega-3 and Christmas time's a good time. Um, and that they will be very rich in omega-3 and, and you know maybe the source of global peace because everyone will have less aggression and impulsive behavior. So, so, um, so these are just fundamental things we're going back to and learning again, learning about again through technology um, but I think it's an, an exciting um, network of people on the south coast that can be can be leaders in this space of new um, marine industries for the future, based on old fundamental understanding of nature. I think the question for you, was well, maybe also a curly one, because it, it seems to me like you'll be leading this 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 way you like i think you know like there are other seaweed farmers down the coast but you know like you're really sparing uh this this space what would your advice be to someone like rob who would say well that could be something for the mob how do we how do we work with you pia how do we do that i've tried to do that actually a lot and it's it's uh the solution isn't easy but today i i actually have um have um uh, Bella works here. She's from Rec Bay Community. So Bella comes in after school um, and I found, I'm finding that um, working with the youth and, and engaging them in what we do is, is um, a really good thing to do. I did build my first seaweed and seaweed and fish farm actually on, on local Koori land here in, in um, Jervis Bay area. Um, and I have spoken a lot to you know people like IBA in business uh, Indigenous Business Australia is a is a is a bank that likes what we do but I'm not Corey and you know merging the business interests and the mandate for Indigenous Business Australia the conservative funding models in Australia are like invest in bricks and mortar and not in IP you go to countries like Germany it's like invest in IP the bricks and mortar don't create anything new. So we need to sort of change that mindset and it would be amazing to be able to work and, and finance collaborative projects with the local indigenous communities. And um, I, I think I showed you all of the products that we can make from this, you know, why don't we work on a collaborative project where one, you know, whether it's a skincare or a type of food, um, the, the actual green seaweed we grow was, was used 
by local Aboriginal people for, for gut health. And we had to do clinical studies to work that out, but they were already doing it. Um, so, so collaborations where we can create um, new brands and things. I, I really think it has to be collaboration though. I, it's, I think there's been a legacy of uh, previously, you know, the opportunities in aquaculture is, you know, fisheries in all good faith would, would bring Aboriginal people up to fisheries office and show them some tanks and aquaculture and say, great, go home and do it. There's a lot of technology in it. And as you and, you know, showed us today, a lot of smart things that um, take a lot of time to develop. But actually those smart things that you and has developed and when I've had um, um, on our farm, you can involve everybody um, in the operations then um, from people who are, you know, just want the simplest tasks and know how to operate from the smartphone each day um, on a farm to the people that want to be uh, doing that in line with the education at the university and developing their knowledge to the people that want to do research in the space. So I think we do need to start somehow formalizing, even though we have these loose networks, we probably need to recognize and formalize the opportunities a little bit more so that they can be supported by, by banks that have that ambition, like the Indigenous Business Australia Bank. We, we had many conversations with uh, with our local friend here, Jade Kennedy, um, and you know a lot of people look at um, Indigenous Australia through like a deficit lens, and we actually want to flip that around and really talk about it from a strength base. And I just remember this one example that you gave. Um, I think it was in the talk the, the kelp farmers that, that pick the kelp off the beaches and and you were talking that you know someone from the south coast informed you that these are also breeding grounds for birds so you should shouldn't actually pick that kelp up is that is that can you you know and this is we wouldn't know that because we are not from that country we wouldn't know that this is a necessarily a, a, a um a, mm. a birthing ground for for birds you know so we would yeah. just have the kelp and, and eat it well yeah. now <laughs> but probably 10 years ago wouldn't have touched no, two years ago wouldn't have touched it but if you can elaborate a little bit on that story because for me it's interesting to say hey, there's knowledge is there that we need to we need to know and understand from that particular place yeah it's a mate it was um you know it was a it's actually from south australia now the the kelp actually washes up on the beaches in large amounts um, and starts to rot and then the tourists complain and everyone whinges about rotting seaweed on beaches but it's a vital, it's fundamental nutrient source for uh, the little organisms in the sand and also the birds that go and pick that and when as the kelp breaks down um, and the little uh, you know uh, crustaceans in the sand and then the birds start eating those crustaceans it's a whole concentration mechanism of omega-3 um, and the, those birds, these are birds that fly from Australia up to the northern hemisphere into the Chinese um, outback, and 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 then they hatch their 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 chicken their babies there. And those chicks and the whole survival of them depends on the omega three that they ate on the beach in Australia. And so all of the systems are connected. Um, and it's important that yes, we can do some beach harvesting. But we can't do so to the extent that we we damage ecosystems that birds like these need because it'll be like you know the silent spring or something when the chemicals were preventing the chicks from hatching um it, the birds need their omega-3 too and they get it from the rotting seaweed on the beaches so we can't just um see it only as a resource we can take a portion of that and do it in a managed way and in, on the south coast of um, new south wales we don't have abundant amounts of, of seaweed. We have very biodiverse seaweed, very, very rich different types of seaweed, but not huge abundant amounts because we actually get the Great Barrier Reef Nemo current coming down the East Coast, which is quite nutrient poor. And so that's why harvesting and scaling that isn't, isn't a solution. But capturing the wasted nutrient opportunities from all sorts of industries um, whether it be the wheat industry, which I'm taking digested natural nutrients from, um, you could do the same for um, any agricultural waste, you know, create biogas plants, ferment it, create CO2 energy and nutrients to grow seaweed from them. 
and then have a no waste um, exit on the coastline. Um, you can also even do it with, say, we're looking at, a, at, at poultry processing plants. As long as you digest the nutrients, you can recapture them again um, and, and turn them back into something valuable instead of them being a nutrient load on the coastline. So for us, it's about the circular economy and how do we capture the wasted resources that we have all up and down the coastline um, and then how do we be smart about using that and turning it into new products again. I could sit here probably spend another three hours with you just listening to this. Like, this, this, this pool of knowledge and wisdom, you know, like this is just incredible. The, the a little announcement, well, little deserves actually a big announcement is that uh, Michelle uh, was successful in a linkage project with with Rob, who sits next to Michelle, and uh, and uh, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna spend time with Junga and Rob uh, and the team, and we are really keen to explore these opportunities in collaboration with uh, existing industry. You know, because there is a there's a really and we're coming from a from a strengths based uh, point of view. Um, and uh, setting setting things in in motion down the coast uh, with with everyone who wants to participate. Uh, so we're going to be coming your way again. I'm pretty sure by the sounds of it. And uh, yeah, thanks, Michelle, for uh, um, putting Blue Futures together and seeing it through all the way to the end. Uh, it was I'm, I'm really really glad I, I didn't walk out last minute and you didn't accept my resignation uh, before it even started. And it was an absolute pleasure working with with Hugh on the enabling stream and. Uh, also, the thanks to again the entrepreneurship program who actually funded our trips down the coast so that we can actually take the university out of the ivory tower and put it uh, put it where it belongs into the community. And uh, yeah, so thank you all for coming along. And uh, I wish you all the best. Unless there's any last questions to the audience um, and open the floor because we do have a few minutes but we also know that one and a half hours is just keeps dragging um and it's getting tiring so are there any last questions i've got a question that we was we've been asking at some of the other seminars and i'm just wondering if i could jump in and ask the, the three presenters today it's a very very open question which is just and, and has been touched on but I'd, I'd love a sort of one or two sentence answer to the question what do you see a blue future look looking like what do you imagine a blue future would look like um, and it can be as very local or very um, global um, so if I maybe start with Pia what if I was to ask you what do you imagine a blue future looks like what would it be for you well, for us, I think on the on the south coast, I think it's a, around um, you know, one collaborations, but the network of, of food that we can make from the coastline here and our opportunity on the south coast is that is that our catchments are superb and intact, and so you can compare our coastlines to you know what Tasmania markets itself on is pristine. You know that we really have wonderful nutrient rich estuaries along our coastline. That are feeding the coastline, but we should. It's clean water. We don't have heavy metal industries, um, and and so I see that 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 should be uh, our future of understanding the feeding of our coastline from the catchments, and that that is our that is our system of life down here, and and we need to therefore protect those catchments um, and nurture the industry growth um, around that system. Thank you. Um, Ewan, how would you answer that, that question? What's a blue future for you? Uh, unmute first, though. This is what <laughs> <clears throat> it's a it's a thr a thriving thriving aquaculture industry. You know, it it again really passionate about the fact that we can if we could double oyster production and we still won't be anywhere near the tradition what what was historic you know oyster you know levels in the rivers. Um, there's nothing but benefit to 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 growing seaweed, to growing oysters. It's an economic reason to protect our environment. There's social enterprise aspects, you know, it's, 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 it's work that people want to be involved in where they want to live, you know? So 
I really, I do, do think that's that's what I want to see. Where it's really embr- an industry that's embraced and becomes, you know, like like fishing used to be. You know, it used to it, it's something that is part of the community and that actually brings benefit to the community. So beautiful, thank you. And finally, Rob, if you're able to answer that question, I suppose in a very simple sort of way, uh, just a quadruple bottom line for um, I suppose the UN nation. Um, uh, right across the claim area. Uh, yeah, that's that's really the whole objective, I suppose, is to try and find that balance. Thank you. All right, Ms. thanks for jumping in, Josh. And yeah, we wrap it up. Um, Merry Christmas, everyone, and please support the South Coast. They had, uh, what did they had? Bushfires, COVID and a rainy start to the summer season. So I guess I see you all down at the South Coast at some point. All right, all right. see you all. Thanks everyone.